Good afternoon, every, good afternoon, everybody. I am very happy to welcome you all to today's uh, Curiosity During Quarantine uh, Lecture by Professor Jagdish Krishnaswamy. At the outset, I would like to congratulate ICTS for continuing their effort to hold these popular lectures even during these trying times. Like everybody else, Jawaharlal Nehru Planetarium is also going through difficult times. In fact, many of our staff were on COVID duty at different places in Bangalore. I'm happy that all of them are back now and we are resuming our activities. All our uh, weekend cl science classes have started online. Yeah. And uh, government has given permission for theaters to operate because of which we have resumed our shows. In fact, today we are having uh, full shows of course, we had to make all the arrangements as per SOP. And I do sincerely hope that conditions will improve sufficiently enough in the coming months and it will become possible for us to have copy lectures at uh, JNP. I once again welcome all of you to today's lecture and also thank Professor Jagadish Krishnaswamy for agreeing to give this talk. I request Professor Rukmini Day to introduce the speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Galgali. Uh, uh, good evening, everyone. From On behalf of ICTS Outreach Team, I give you a warm welcome to today's KDK. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have with us Dr. Jagdish Krishnaswamy of Atri, Bangalore, to give the KDK talk today. Dr. Jagdish has a BTEC in Civil Engineering from IIT Mumbai and PhD in Environmental Studies, Duke, Duke University of USA. His research and teaching interests include eco-hydrology, landscape ecology, conservation planning, ecosystem services, and applications of Bayesian approaches in understanding complex changes in the environment over space and time. He has coordinated the establishment of instrumented catchments in Western Ghats and in the Himalayas to study the impacts of land cover and climate variability on hydrological processes. He is the coordinator, coordinating lead author of the special IPCC report on climate change, desertification, degradation and uh, sustainable land, land management. Today, he'll be talking on can forests in India influence rainfall? It's a great honor to have you, sir, with us. Uh, maybe you can start now. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Rukmini. Uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Pramod, uh, Anupam, and everybody else. Uh, it's a pleasure and a privilege being uh, part of the ICTS uh, series. Um, and uh, I, uh, keeping in, in line with the spirit of uh, of the uh, uh, of the curiosity part, I decided that I will explore a topic which is not in my comfort area, which is something that I actually don't do uh, as an active part of my work. So that was the the my own curiosity that I combined with the uh, with the letter and spirit of uh, of this series, um, curiosity during quarantine. So that's the topic that we'll be looking at. Um, in fact. Um, much of the work I do is about what happens when the rainfall falls on the forest um, and what happens subsequently to that water. So, but what forests do to rainfall is an area of curiosity for, for me as well. So that's why we are jointly exploring this uh, topic during the quarantine. So the historical context is, uh, you know, for, for many centuries uh, in different parts of the world, people have uh, thought about how forests, uh, our vegetation can influence uh, rainfall. It goes back, you know, many several hundreds of years and in different parts of the, uh, you know, both in India and in Greece and so on. But the modern era in terms of instrumentation and, and the discourse um, is uh, about uh, around, you know, 1850s or so. And uh, Basically, uh, the fur, it was this what is known as a desiccation theory, which is basically that if you remove vegetation, um, then uh, you know it is going to 
um, cause a uh, reduction in rainfall. So this uh, debate has been going on for, for 200 years. And uh, uh, interestingly enough, uh, some of the ideas that were debunked um, in, the, in the end of the 19th century have now resurfaced because of recent evidence in the last few decades. So that's why this is uh, very interesting that you know, some things that were dismissed out of hand um, for almost a uh, hundred years have now come back uh, with new evidence, new approaches and new methods. So uh, it all started with the, with the view that if you uh, remove uh, forest cover or, or you remove vegetation, um, because vegetation attracts rainfall, uh, therefore that will also cause a decrease in rainfall. And then later on, um, forests uh, were seen as existing in places where there was rainfall to begin with and not the other way around. So this is basically uh, what uh, I'm going to be talking to you about uh, is the, something that has uh, come into our notice in the last uh, 30 or 40 years based on new work. So something that was dismissed uh, in the, by the 1890s or so has come back uh, in a big way now. So that's the interesting part. And the, and the thing is uh, that uh, contrary to what initially was proposed, that uh, it's because of vegetation that there is rainfall, uh, we started learning that actually vegetation responds to rainfall. So here is just a graph showing the distribution of different types of forests. And you can see, for example, that tropical evergreen forest is located uh, in places on earth where uh, there's a particular temperature regime and there's a particular uh, very wet um, you know, rainfall regime, um, you know, uh, up to uh, 3,000 to 4,000 millimeters of rainfall a year and so on. And then the other types of forests are found in other parts of it. So, so you can see clearly from this that yes, of course, uh, the vegetation is responding to the climate and not the other way around. And that was a prevailing uh, view for a very long time. And so you can see the distribution of uh, forests around the world, different types of forests generally follows uh, the rule that uh, the climate determines what type of vegetation can grow. And that's largely true. But what we are looking at today is whether once there is vegetation, what does it do to the rainfall? And that's a little bit more complex, something that I don't do research in uh, as, as, as much as I would like to. So that, that's my uh, contribution to the curiosity. So the outline of my talk is going to be, I'm going to start with, with the, some of the work that, uh, that I do or some of the thoughts I have linking forests and hydrology. Then we'll look at forests and rainfall uh, globally. Then we will look at what evidence is there from India. And then what does it mean for uh, future work and, and our own policy responses? So uh, I'll start with the uh, water balance of an, any ecosystem. You can have an input rainfall, which is a precipitation input. In this case, let's assume that it's uh, not snow or ice. Let's, let's keep it simply as a rainfall. And the rain falls on the, on the leaves of, uh, and branches of the tree. Some of that water uh, from the leaves and branches will evaporate directly into the atmosphere. So that is the evaporation part. Some of the rainfall that falls on the soil will also directly evaporate. And that's uh, again contributes to the, to the evaporation part. But then there is also a part of the rainfall that is going to infiltrate into the soil. And, uh, and that is what is tapped by the roots of the plant. And through a process uh, called transpiration, um, there is a connection between the, the signals of uh, the scarcity of water uh, felt by the roots, uh, and then that signaled all the way up to the leaves. And so there is what is known as a water potential gradient. So, uh, so it's not a, a passive process, it's an active process in the sense that the plant can control. So eventually you have the water um, reaching the uh, stoma, stomata of the leaves, and then based on the uh, conditions outside, uh, the, there would be a uh, release of that water vapor from the saturation con conditions inside the leaf tissue into the atmosphere. So there is basically, in some sense, you can look at the tree as a, has the ability to pump water, subsoil water uh, into the atmosphere. And that is an important part of the uh, 
of the discourse. And of course, this process of transpiration uh, is, mo is most active when the leaf is um, photosynthetically active. That is when it's doing photosynthesis during peak daylight hours, you can expect that transpiration uh, is going to be a part of that. Because if the stoma are open, uh, there is exchange of carbon dioxide from outside, um, so there's fixing of carbon, and then at the same time, the water vapor uh, goes out through the stomata into the atmosphere. So that's basically the water balance. The in input precipitation is equal to the evapotranspiration. So now you have transpiration added to the evaporation that I talked about. So that's together called as evapotranspiration. Then you have some, some of the rainwater would flow directly on the surface of the soil or uh, through subsurface channels. So that would be runoff part. Some of it would uh, contribute to the change in the storage in the system. So that's the DS term. And then the last capital D term is the deep drainage, which is basically uh, some of the, of the rainwater that infiltrates into the soil, goes past the rooting zone and recharges the groundwater. So here are two different types of ecosystems. In fact, I took these uh, pictures in the same trip in the same national park, uh, the Ervikulam National Park in, uh, in Kerala. And you can see on the left-hand side, you have mid-elevation uh, mountain forest. On the right-hand side, you have a high-elevation grassland. Now, the manner in which these two types of vegetation transforms input rainfall into different components of the hydrologic cycle or the hydrologic budget or the water balance, as we call it, is quite different. Uh, trees, uh, this, uh, on the left-hand side, you have a very multi-layered uh, mid-elevation rainforest. Um, on the right-hand side, uh, you have a grassland ecosystem. And uh, the rooting depth of the forest, uh, forest trees is much deeper, plus there are multiple layers. Whereas the grassland ecosystem, the rooting depth is lower, and also overall surface area available for photosynthesizing or for, uh, for uh, transpiring is much less. So, um, so, so if I had to ask you which of these two systems has a better ability to transfer um, moisture from the subsoil into the atmosphere, uh, hopefully um, most of you will be able to guess that it's uh, the le left-hand side, the ecosystem, the forest ecosystem, which is likely to have a much higher rate of uh, transpiration compared to the grassland ecosystem, all things else being equal. Uh, so here is a graph uh, which shows that the annual evapotranspiration uh, for different types of vegetation, starting from grassland, forest, and so on, mixed vegetation. And on the x-axis, you have annual rainfall. So you can see that as the annual rainfall increases, the evapotranspiration between, say, grassland and forest, that difference keeps on increasing. So you can see that uh, after about... Uh, about uh, 600 millimeters of annual rainfall, you can see that the difference between the grassland ecosystem and the forest ecosystem in terms of um, ability to um, convert large amounts of the input precipitation into evapotranspiration becomes much higher. So the ability to pump more water into the atmosphere is much higher for uh, deep-rooted forest vegetation compared to grassland uh, vegetation. So this is something that is borne out by a large number of experiments around the world. So here is an example of a very different type of forest. Uh, remember, I had shown a graph where I showed the distribution of different types of forest uh, based on temperature and uh, rainfall. Now, this is from the Bandipur Tiger Reserve in Karnataka, and this is a dry deciduous forest. As you can see in this, uh, in this uh, photo, uh, a lot of the trees don't have uh, photosynthetically active foliage on them. So this is the dry season. So these are dry deciduous forests, and many of the species of trees shed their leaves at the beginning or the middle of the dry season. And so if you shed your leaves, you don't have any ability to photosynthesize. If you don't have the ability to photosynthesize, you're not going to be transpiring. So the, so the transpiration rates overall evapotranspiration rates during the dry season for a forest such as this is going to be uh, much less compared to an evergreen forest, which has access to moisture throughout the year. So that's, the, that's to show that, uh, that you have very different ecosystem, forest ecosystems, uh, which have 
very diverse ways of partitioning the moisture into. Of course, this ecosystem exists. Uh, dry deciduous forest ecosystems may exist with rainfalls ranging from about 700 millimeters a year to about 950 millimeters a year. So generally on the lower side compared to the humid rainforests. So this is a, the Gundal uh, River uh, stream. Uh, coming from the northern part of the Biligiri Ranga Temple Wildlife Sanctuary. So this has a combination of dry deciduous and moist deciduous forests. And I just want to point out how this Gundal, um, you can see the Gundal catchment um, using the normalized difference vegetation index, which is basically a remotely sensed way of looking at the how green the uh, foliar uh, canopy is. Um, and you can see that in November, uh, the NDVA is very high. Almost the entire catchment has got uh, photosynthetically active and therefore transpiring vegetation. As you go through February and April, you can see that the NDVA is reducing. So you can. This is the response of of uh, vegetation to moisture limitation. These are deciduous forests. Whereas if the if the this had been a evergreen forest, the change in NDVI from November to April would not have been as much at all. In fact, it would be relatively uh, stable. So this is an evergreen forest and this would be uh, maintaining high rates of transpiration uh, throughout the dry season. So now, how does uh, the dry season stream flow uh, as a function of forest cover? Um, so we have mentioned that transpiration is an important part of the hydrologic budget of any forest ecosystem. So if you have an increase in forest cover or if you have a change in forest cover, what might happen to the dry season stream flow? So there are three actually competing uh, hypotheses uh, or uh, phenomena that have been noted by uh, hydrologists throughout the world. So this is uh, from a piece of work I did with colleagues in Costa Rica. Uh, and this is applicable to some parts of the Western Ghats as well. So basically uh, we have three types of of phenomena that's possible. So the gray arrow and the black arrow basically show the relative strength of the phenomena. So you have, uh, so dry season stream flow uh, could be uh, increasing with percentage forest cover. And so that is basically the phenomena, the topmost phenomena, this one. So this curve I'm talking about, this line, where the infiltration and the recharge to groundwater is a dominant process. And the evapotranspiration is not as dominant. So in which case the infiltration, the recharge dominates over the evapotranspiration. So if you have an increase in forest cover, you would actually have um, a greater contribution to the dry season stream flow. And that is known as the sponge effect. And many foresters and many conservationists have always latched on to the sponge effect of forests um, under all conditions. Um, however, we have to note that the sponge effect um, has been noticed and measured only in a few cases. And of course, those cases are increasing now with new evidence. So, but as a paradigm, it dominated uh, the forest conservation discourse uh, much more than any of the other uh, paradigm for a, for a long time. Now you can have uh, the second phenomena where the infiltration and recharge are equal in strength to the uh, evapotranspiration, in which case, there will be a neutral effect, which means that with changes in forest cover, you may not see much changes in the dry season stream flow. And then you have the uh, third phenomena or the third competing hypothesis where evapotranspiration is the most, much more dominant over the uh, infiltration and recharge part. And so in those situations, the dry season stream flow will decrease as the percentage tree cover or percentage forest cover increases over time. So, uh, and I just want to point out that for a long time, many of the instrumented catchment studies from around the world uh, were dominated by this impact, that is the evapotranspiration part, part. And many of them showed a decline in uh, dry season stream flow uh, with increase in forest cover and so on. And, and vice versa, when you remove some of the trees. And, but, but now there is evidence for, the, for this as well. So now let's get to forests and rainfall. Now this is a this is a a, um, a part of the new evidence that is emerging. Um, this is a paper which was uh, published by Spracklin in Nature, 
and this basically shows uh, large parts of the of large tracts of forest like in Amazonian in the Congo Basin, even the Western Ghats, you can see a thin sliver showing up here, Southeast Asia and so on. And then what they have done in this is to see what role these forests play in, in recharging the moisture as rain clouds pass over them. So this was a very, uh, this was basically a paper uh, that was uh, following on the footsteps of several other papers which had already demonstrated that large patches of forests because of the high evapotranspiration, they can actually help moisten the clouds that pass over them. And so the, the greater amount of time and pathways that a, that a um, air parcel uh, spends passing over a forested tract, the more moisture it is likely to gain. And so this is uh, clearly demonstrated uh, with the modeling as well as uh, other pieces of evidence. And we can actually see that even though the main focus of this paper was the large pieces of forest in Amazonia and, and the Congo basin and so on, actually, if, when we actually zoom in on India, I'll show you later, the, there is a, there is a, it is that, that phenomena was noted for Indian forests as well. And here is basically uh, this graph here, rainfall on the y-axis and what is known as cumulative leaf area index. That's simply a complicated way of saying that, that you're accumulating more and more uh, um, influence of foliage as a, as a, let's say you're a rain cloud passing over, let's say 200 kilometers of forest or so 400 kilometers of forest, then you're likely to be um, you know, going over more foli foliated surfaces, which are releasing water vapor. And so you tend to pick up uh, more moisture. So basically this, this piece of work showed that uh, uh, the contribution of forests to rain clouds that are passing over is quite uh, clear and, and there is no doubt about that. However, a more controversial uh, uh, piece of work emerged uh, some years back by a group of Russian physicists, uh, Makariva and Gorshkov, and uh, Professor Gorshkov is no longer with us, uh, but they came up with a very interesting theory um, that it's not just the, that the evapotranspiration is uh, helping with, the, uh, uh, with uh, causing rainfall elsewhere by moistening the clouds. Uh, they also showed that in fact, uh, the, that once you have large amounts of transpiration coming out of a forest, and when, it, uh, a, when that goes up into the atmosphere and condenses uh, forms into clouds. So basically you're removing large amounts of water vapor out of the atmosphere into the liquid phase. There's a drop in pressure and that uh, drop in pressure uh, attracts uh, uh, winds from elsewhere to take its place. And therefore you set into play into motion what they call it as a biotic pump. So basically they were able to explain that uh, it's that the winds are also being influenced by uh, forest cover. So this was very controversial. It has been contested by many others uh, in, the, in the field, but it's still holding its own. And, and it, this uh, hypothesis has got some supporters. And so this is basically uh, this new hypothesis that came some years back. And it's fascinating reading how, the, how this is still being, um, you know, being contested by other folks who basically are saying that the, that the pressure differences caused by condensation and, uh, are already taken care of in existing mechanistic models. Others argue that when you have, um, you know, uh, condensation, there is also uh, the lot of heat is released, right? I mean, after all, the water vapor is becoming liquid water, and so that heat actually counter uh, counter uh, has a counter effect on the changes in pressure and. But um, Makariva and Goshka basically argued that the heat released, that goes up much higher and it doesn't impact the reduction in pressure that happens when condensation. And they were also able to use this hypothesis to explain how uh, that even in the interior of, uh, even in places in very large continents, you have fairly uh, high levels of rainfall in the interior of continents far away from the coast. And they were basically explaining that in terms of the patches of forest, which acted as this, um, as a continuous set of, of biotic pumps, which enabled the uh, system to, to penetrate inland and, and uh, have rainfall in the middle of these uh, continents. 
So I'm not going to get much into that, but this is, as I said, a very controversial uh, hypothesis. So there are these two, uh, the first part, which I explained about evapotranspiration contributing to moistening the clouds which are passing over, nobody's contesting that. But this one, where the forest, presence of a forest can actually set into motion a biotic pump which attracts winds inland, that part is still uh, controversial. So that's basically where, uh, this is just to show a graphic, uh, very recently there was a discussion this year as well, uh, and earlier as well for a long time um, on, on this theory, and it continues to um, be a source of uh, curiosity for us. And we are hoping that uh, we will learn more, much more about this um, with the new types of modeling as well. However, what is not contested is that the large patches of forests um, which are contributing to high levels of evapotranspiration have led to what are known as flying rivers. So uh, we all know about the large rivers that flow on the earth, right? The, the Ganga, the Brahmaputra, the Amazon, the Nile, and the Congo, and so on. But these are rivers in the sky, and these rivers are sustained by the high levels of evapotranspiration coming out of forests. So that is basically, um, and, and this is also not contested. So in fact, some modeling suggests that 80% of China's rain uh, comes from the West, thanks to a trans-Siberian flying river. And uh, the Amazon, uh, Amazon's flying river provides 70% of the rain for Southeastern South America. And there are flying rivers elsewhere in the, on, uh, as well. And I will come to the evidence from India later on. So this is what the green water, uh, Flux. What is green water flux? It's the amount of the rainfall that gets converted into evapotranspiration. So when, when, when before human influence, uh, you would have had uh, a much larger area of, of the world uh, being under forest cover that would be, uh, you know, pumping out large amounts of uh, evapotranspiration into the atmosphere. So this is just to show what, what used to be there. And now, of course, the green water flux has reduced over time because of changes in, in land use and land cover and deforestation and so on. Now, we did talk about that forests at a local scale can cause reduction in dry season stream flow, right? Like if you suppose you start planting trees or you start restoring some area by planting trees, uh, we said that uh, there is a, out of those three hypotheses I talked about, uh, one of them suggests that, uh, and it's a dominant um, hypothesis because a lot of the experimental work measurements around the world from catchments have suggested that evapotranspiration dominated uh, impact is there much more compared to, so 70% of the studies would lean towards the evapotranspiration dominated uh, hypothesis and 30% perhaps towards the sponge effect. So what we have here is basically a matter of scale. So at a local scale, a forest could be uh, reducing the amount of uh, water flowing in the stream in the dry season, but at a larger scale, it is sustaining rainfall. So if on the y-axis I have regulating ecosystem services, which is basically the services provided by, by nature to humans, at a larger spatial scale, forests might be influencing rainfall positively. And yet, on, on, a, on the, at a local scale, we might actually be having a trade-off. So this is just to show that this, th this is very complex. Uh, because the scale at which this phenomena occurs is much larger than the scale at which ecosystem services are, are traditionally uh, being able to be measured. So this scale issue is uh, something that demands our attention. So basically the demand side school emphasizes that trees are net users of water within a catchment. Uh, and so that, that will decrease the overall water available for other users, which includes humans. But at larger spatial scales, we have seen that they help generate and sustain rainfall. Whether or not you believe in the Makareva and Gorsh Gorshko uh, hypothesis, we do know that evapotranspiration is sustaining flying rivers um, and uh, supplying water uh, rain in form of rainfall to many other parts of the world. And so we need to, in some sense, uh, this is at the heart of the debate, whether this link between forest cover and rainfall, um, how, how can we uh, look at this issue uh, when, when both these, uh, you know, local water supply as well as rainfall, both are important for us. So let's look at the evidence from India now. So let's just look at some background information. Since the 19, early 1950s, the overall monsoon in India has been declining. 
Now, this is not well captured in many of our climate models, and uh, attempts are being made to uh, to uh, address those issues. So, basically, if your climate models are not able to simulate the observed past, then your ability, uh, their ability to uh, uh, to uh, predict the future is also brought into question, but a lot of smart uh, climate modelers and scientists are working on this issue. The other thing that has happened to the Indian monsoon is that the lower graph is that the proportion of rainfall that's falling in the low to moderate uh, uh, intensities, that is, um, you know, up to 25 millimeters a day or up to 50 millimeters a day um, is de been decreasing, but the uh, rain events of 150 millimeters or more, or 250 millimeters or more, um, 200 millimeters per day or more, that is increasing. So basically, we are having less amount of rainfall overall, but it's coming in in shorter, more intense bursts. So that's basically what's been happening to our monsoon. So this is just to show uh, the the decline of the monsoon. You can see that parts of the Western Ghats are showing a very pronounced decline in the monsoon and other parts of central peninsular India and so on. So uh, what is this reason for the decline in the Indian monsoon? So many of our climate scientists believe that as the seas and oceans around the uh, Indian landmass are uh, becoming warmer, the thermal contrast between land and sea has been decreasing. So basically, the seas are warming. The, the land was anyway already heated up during the summer. So, so that, but the contrast is declining between the warming seas and the heated landmass. And so that, and as we know, it's this thermal gradient between the sea surface temperature and the land surface temperature. That's one of the important drivers of the monsoon. So if that gradient has been weakening, then overall monsoon has been showing a decline. So this is, um, this is something that, uh, um, for example, uh, Roxy, uh, Matthew Cole, and other scientists from Indian Institute of Tropical Meteorology, they have done a lot of remarkable work on explaining this and finding the evidence for it. Now, to what extent does changes in land use and land cover contribute to this is still unknown, because we said that the thermal gradient between the sea and the land has been um, has been declining. Now, we have also been changing the land use and the land cover since the 1950s. Lots of forests have disappeared. We have replaced them with other types of vegetation and so on. So what has that done anything to the uh, land sea thermal contrast? And this is an open question, even though there's one piece of work by scientists uh, doc, led by Dr. Rajiv in, in the, again, in the Indian Institute of Tropical Metrology, which suggests that changes in land cover could have also have contributed because as you know, um, the forests absorb a lot of the radiation, so the so the albedo is uh, uh, low compared to open areas, and so that was going to be changing the uh, the uh, uh, amount of heat in the land, and and so uh, the losses of forest cover could be contributing, and really nobody knows. Uh, I just had a conversation with uh, Dr. Roxy Ma Matthew Cole this morning. And he was telling me that uh, this is something that we don't know enough about. All we know is, yes, the seas are warming at a much faster rate. And, and that has contributed to the bulk of the decline in the Indian monsoon. But he does not rule out the role of land surface changes in uh, also contributing to this decline of the monsoon. So now that's an area, again, it's a knowledge gap. So what has happened to, I mean, what has, because since the 1950s, large patches of forest have been cleared throughout India including in Western Ghats, in Peninsular India, many parts of India. Has that had any difference, made any difference to this, um, reducing this thermal gradient is something that we need to learn more about. Now, this is a piece of work I did many years ago where we, using very approximate uh, methods, we were able to show the what is known as the green water flux. So this is in millimeters per year. You can see part of the Western Ghats here, and you can see that up to 15, that is 1500 millimeters a year of, of evapotranspiration. That's sort of coming from the wet evergreen forest. And other parts of the Western Ghats have much less, depending on the type of forest they have. So you can see that the Western Ghats is a big uh, pump house. It's, it's, it's pumping out large amounts of, of moisture uh, into the atmosphere. Um, and so that's uh, what is it, what happens to this moisture? So when, when we were coming up with these maps, we didn't really know whether this moisture had any role in influencing rainfall. 
Uh, but then other pieces of evidence started coming in from, from other scientists that a large part of the a significant part of the rainfall that falls in different parts of India is actually recycled moisture, which means that if the rain has fallen, it has then um, gotten into the soil, and then there's a vegetation that absorbs it and then releases it back. Now, this could be forest or it could be even irrigated crops. And all of this actually then feeds back into, the into sustaining the monsoon system. So I don't want to spend time on this, but different parts of India have different levels of this phenomena um, um, playing a role. So let's get to the uh, Himalayas, for example. This is a uh, Himalayan forests are a long stretch of, uh, of uh, um, and they are in some sense the considered as the third pole. Um, they are very important for our water resources, for our ecology, our ecological security of India. And uh, I'm just going to take you back to the paper uh, by Spracklin in Nature, where, as I, as I said, India was not mentioned as an important part of the results. But what I did is I just zoomed in on, on that graph. And you can see, actually, that in terms of the vegetation impact of moisture in air and the significance of, of the modeling uh, of the results, um, India actually comes in the significant part. And so this, uh, st this stippled uh, uh, the stippled region here, the, can you see these dots here? Basically, that shows areas where the air which has been exposed to vegetation has twice or more moisture than air not exposed to vegetation. So India was part of the significant result, but because of the tiny sliver of forests that show up on a global map, it was not as seen as significant as impact of the Amazon forest or the Congo forest or even the forests in Southeast Asia. But I just want to point out that uh, this is something that uh, so we have evidence from various sources. Now let's look at some work which is all, which is being done within India. So uh, this is uh, this is from the from Nepal, um, and which basically shows that that the uh, uh, this is way back in 2002, and tucked away in the middle of the paper towards the end, I think, not even in the middle of the paper, slightly towards the end. There is a based on direct measurements using a bunch of uh, instruments, including things that are, uh, you know, balloons and, and radio sound, many other uh, pieces of work measurements. The evapotranspiration on the local vegetation in these uh, Himalayan slopes that was contributing between 15 to 35 percent was being recycled back as rainfall, and it was contributing up up to from 0.5 to 6 millimeters of rainfall a day. And so the interesting part that drove my attention is that this mechanism persists even when the local areas are delinked or isolated from the monsoon flow. So we know that the monsoon flow can penetrate deep into the mountain, but it doesn't happen every time. So for days on end, it could the, the, the local uh, diurnal cycle of rainfall was being sustained by local recycling of moisture mediated by the forests in the on the slopes of the Himalayas. So this is another piece of evidence of how forests can influence rainfall um, from the Himalayas. So getting back to this green water flux, we can overall we can say that the impacts of forest vegetation on regional climate is a completely, in some sense, an understudied subject in, in India. Uh, and you know that the discourse has often been dominated by the large patches of forest in the Amazon, the Congo, and so on. And we, we used to think that these things live as a forest on a global scale. You know, our forests are quite extensive when we look at it locally or regionally. But when you look at it globally and compare it to, um, say, the Congo or the Amazon, obviously they don't uh, appear very, um, but we have uh, thousands of square kilometers of connected forests, uh, including in the Western Ghats, including in uh, Northeast India, the Western Himalayas, and the Central Indian Highlands. So do they play any role uh, in, in uh, our rainfall mechanisms? This is an area of, uh, of research that really needs reinforcement. We don't know enough about it. So, but uh, there was a group from uh, Indian Institute of Technology, Mumbai, which showed that the evapotranspiration from the Western Ghats forest is a significant source of the monsoon rainfall in Tamil Nadu. So you have the green water flux from the Western Ghats, which many years ago when I made this map, I, I didn't know what influence it had on rainfall. And the answer is now being provided by this uh, modeling work done by the IIT Mumbai group, uh, which says that the evapotranspiration goes back uh, and falls as rainfall in Tamil Nadu, which is a water uh, deficient area. Now, the other uh, aspect 
that I have not yet mentioned, apart from evapotranspiration, is aerosols. As you know, that for rainfall to actually happen, uh, it's not just enough to have moisture in the clouds. You, you know, moisture in the uh, in the atmosphere. You also know for it to become water droplets and fall as rainfall. You need what is known as cloud condensation nuclei. Now these are particles, mineral particles of various kinds, and they are uh, they come from various sources. There are natural sources. They come from the sea, the sea spray, the you know sulfate aerosols. You have volcanoes which are released these mineral particles. You have dust from the deserts. You also have human, um, you know, biomass burning, uh, fossil fuel combustion. There are so many different types of uh, aerosols which are being released into the atmosphere, increasingly so because of, of uh, human activities. So, uh, and forests also have their own natural aerosols. You know, these are, uh, you know, many volatile compounds, organic compounds uh, are released by forests. But in most parts of the world, this, they seem to be, paling into insignificance in some sense because of the domination by the uh, um, huge contribution coming from uh, anthropogenic activities. However, we cannot rule out the role that they play. So uh, we know that aerosols uh, are now uh, from the Gangetic Plains and other parts that are even going deep into the Himalayas. So uh, even our so-called pristine forests are, are being impacted by um, the aerosols that are reaching the uh, uh, you know, these remote areas from other parts where there is biomass burning or, or other types of human use. Now, there's a recent piece of work, again, which uh, two papers, I had to put, put the two pieces of the puzzle together. Basically, one piece of work by Roy et al. 2017 suggests that, uh, that there is a high loading of cloud condensation nuclei during the spring season in some parts of the Himalayas. At the same time, these are the, during that time when you have high, high levels of uh, cloud condensation nuclei, you also have high levels of transpiration from the forest. Uh, and so the interaction between both the natural cloud condensation nuclei, natural aerosols from the forest, plus now the added new dimension of uh, anthropogenically contributed uh, uh, aerosols could be interacting with the, with the transpiration and causing uh, triggering local, local rain events. So this is again an area uh, of work which is just beginning to be investigated. So you actually have an interesting um, combination of, of human induced changes interacting with the, uh, with the natural phenomena of, uh, and then uh, having this interesting impact. So this is again something, is another way in which uh, forests could be influencing rainfall, not just through the transpiration part, but also the interaction of transpiration with the, both human uh, aerosols, as well as natural aerosols released by the forest itself. So uh, we have had a lot of changes in land use and land cover. Uh, so this is just to show you that since 1981, uh, we, can, we have this uh, um, basically both greening and browning being observed over large parts of the um, of the, so this is the northern part of the subcontinent. So you can see some parts of the Himalayas are uh, greening, others are browning. But I can also want to draw your attention to the fact that you can see a huge area here, which is showing on the positive side, which is basically um, the uh, increases in the green cover or the crop, irrigated crops in the Indo-Gangetic Plains. And recent modeling studies have shown that the evapotranspiration from the irrigated croplands in the Indo-Gangetic Plains is also providing feedback to the monsoon. So now you can see how difficult it is for us to tease apart the, the role, relative role of different sources of, uh, of, of evapotranspiration to monsoonal feedbacks. So there's also the added dimension of, of the carbon dioxide fertilization effect. As you know, the concentration of carbon dioxide are rising so now for this, for a plant uh, doesn't have to keep the stoma open for as long as it used to, because if you have a higher level of a higher concentration of carbon dioxide, you could be fixing the same amount of carbon by keeping the stoma open for less amount of time. If you keep the stoma open for less amount of time, you lose less water through transpiration. So this is known as uh, the, you know, the water use efficiency and so on. Now, how natural forests are going to be responding to this is still an area of inquiry. It has been observed in some arid areas. Uh, there is, for example, uh, 
bush cover and shrubs have started invading some semi-arid grasslands in some parts of the world because now they're able to grow in areas with the, where the rainfall hasn't uh, changed. But because of the carbon dioxide fertilization effect, they're able to um, consume less water. So with less water, they're able to fix this uh, adequate amounts of carbon and so sustain themselves. So whether how this phenomenon is going to impact forests in India is still an area of, uh, of, of curiosity that we need to investigate. On top of that, India is also a hotspot for nitrogen deposition. So, and, um, and these are the hotspots of nitrogen deposition around the world and including the Himalayas and so on, many parts of the, of the country, we have high, very high levels of nitrogen deposition. Now that is also going to be impacting the productivity of the forest. It's going to impact the um, transpiration and everything else. And so this whole impact of forests on rainfall is going to get more and more complex with all these other additional drivers. So I just want to end by saying that on this phenomena that the attribution is becoming very difficult. We have narrow patches of forest relative to spatial resolution of modeling currently. So we need to have more work on on isotopes, for example, oxygen 18 and so on, where you can you can see the, we know that evapotranspired water has higher levels of oxygen 18 compared to the other isotopes. So these, and also other types of modeling where the resolution can be improved. Once we do that, only then we can have attribution. That is the actual role of forests in India to rainfall can be investigated properly. And also we have seen in the case of the aerosols and so on, that anthropogenic and natural processes are confounding each other. Even the evapotranspiration from agricultural areas, irrigated agriculture uh, is going to also contributing to the feedback to the monsoon. And then you also have the forest contributing. So teasing apart these are going to be very complex. And we have seen that both greening and browning are occurring in India. So that makes the, uh, the whole area fascinating as well as very challenging to research. So that is, uh, uh, I would like to end that, that part. And then what does it mean? Uh, we suppose we do find the evidence that, uh, as they are finding evidence from the Himalayas and from the Western Ghats, that uh, forests are having some positive feedback to the rainfall mechanism. Does it mean that we have to be planting trees everywhere? Certainly not. We know that, that trees belong in certain types of ecosystems. So we shouldn't be going around planting trees in grasslands or along rivers and wherever we, we think uh, it's because it's not going to, uh, first of all, it's not going to be having this impact. And certainly, uh, it, as we have seen, tra trees, uh, if you try to grow trees in areas where moisture is limiting, we have seen that from the graph I showed you that you could have a net decrease in soil moisture and you could have reduced stream flow in your rivers and streams. So, uh, so the lesson from this is that whatever good, uh, good uh, tracts of forest that are there, please take care of them. Uh, so we have the Western Ghats, we have, the, we have the forests in the Northeast India, the Central uh, Highlands, uh, the Satpura forests, Western Himalayas. So, so those forests are, have to be conserved for a variety of other reasons. Uh, we have lots of reasons for conserving forests and the ecosystem services that they provide. The rainfall connection would definitely help raise the profile of larger connected forests. So the, so the lesson from this is that the, whichever larger patches of forests that we have remaining in the country, we should definitely be looking at them uh, as, as helping with the ecological and climatic security of India. And we definitely have missed the bus in terms of long-term observatories and sites. Otherwise, we would have learned much more about the role that forests play in various uh, phenomena and, and, and ecological services that they provide to us. Uh, unfortunately, we don't even have a single site where we have say 60 or 70 years of data. And we are just beginning to set up plots and instrumented sites um, and, and so in that sense, we have missed a bus, but there is, um, but I think it's not too late to invest in this as, as we really want to learn about what's likely to be happening in the near future. So that's basically where I would like to end. And I would really like to thank everybody for giving me this opportunity to share my own curiosity um, and, my, and the uncertainty that went along with assessing what is known about this very complex phenomena uh, using the evidence from India. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Krishna Swami, for this wonderful, very interesting talk. And uh, uh, so you will be willing now to take questions? Yes, yes.
So uh, I would request Ipshita to moderate the question and answer session. Ipshita? Hello, Ipshita? Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah, uh, we got one question pretty early uh, in the talk. Uh, Anushka wanted to know the difference between the runoff, the term runoff and drainage. Okay, so so typically when uh, you have rainfall falling on uh, any piece of vegetation, any ecosystem, uh, I mentioned that some of that water, uh, some of that precipitation or rainfall will end up on the soil. Some of it will infiltrate into the soil and so on. Some of it will di run directly on the soil. So that is the rate at which the rainfall is falling. If it is much higher than the rate at which the soil can allow infiltration, then you have what is known as a, uh, you have a infiltration excess overland flow. So that is a runoff, that's a surface runoff. So you would have seen when you're going in the forest or other places, uh, or even in urban areas where uh, you know you have so many impervious surfaces, you will see, for example, in a parking lot or even on the roadside or curbs, you will see these puddles of water. That's basically because the rate at which rainfall is falling is exceeding the rate at which the uh, soil is able to absorb that. So that is known as uh, the surface runoff. Now there's another part of runoff that is called rapid subsurface flow. So basically, you have these large macro pores. Uh, often found in forested areas in the Western Ghats, example, and in any, any uh, many other places where the water does infiltrate into the soil, but it doesn't reach the rooting depth uh, or it doesn't get absorbed by the vegetation and become transpiration. What it does is it goes into these uh, uh, pipes, which then lead to very rapid drainage and it goes directly into the nearest stream. So that is known as rapid subsurface flow. So rapid subsurface flow plus uh, surface flow together is often called as runoff. And what you call uh, referring to as deep drainage is that any rain water that falls on the soil infiltrates through the, through the soil, doesn't get uh, absorbed by the roots and, and then is able to reach the groundwater and recharge it. That is known as deep drainage. Thank you, sir. Uh, we have two more questions right now. And uh, one of them is on how the temperature uh, gradient between land and ocean drives rain. Yeah, so, so basically, uh, we, we know that uh, land uh, can get heated up very fast, right? During the day, for example, you would have noticed this, um, you know, the land and sea breezes you would have learned about in, in uh, school. Right? And, and the day and night breezes and so on. So now think about that phenomena, but now apply to such a la large landmass as India, surrounded by the uh, uh, different seas and oceans. So um, you know that uh, during the summer, uh, the Indian landmass is getting heated up. And, uh, and then the oceans, you know, uh, any water body uh, has got a, a very high capacity to absorb heat without increasing temperature, right? So, um, and so it takes a long time for that to happen. So then you also, then that sets into motion this uh, thermal gradient between the heated up land mass and the less hot oceans and seas. Now what's been happening due to global warming is that the seas are also now warming. And now the land is already heated up to its potential, let's say. So it can't really heat up too much beyond that. So what is happening is that as the seas sea surface temperature has been rising over the last few decades, the contrast between land and sea has reduced. And because that contrast is reduced, um, the, the, the uh, differences uh, that in pressure and so on, which led to the, uh, the, the monsoon flow into India, uh, that uh, has been weakened. So that's basically what's been happening. So the next question we have is uh, regarding some of the information you provided during your talk. That is, what is the mo mechanism responsible between uh, the short, intense burst of rain we have sometimes? Not the steady, uh, long-lasting uh, rain, but those spurts of uh, rainfall that we get, with, which seems heavy for a while, but then stops. So they want to know the mechanism behind this. Yeah, so there are different types of rainfall. There's convective rainfall. There is um, other types of rainfall. But one of the things that has happened with the uh, glo global warming 
is that the um, hydrologic cycle or the water cycle has been accelerated. So you have higher temperatures, which lead to higher levels of evaporation from both the ocean seas and other inland water bodies, even from vegetation. So you have lots of water vapor going quickly into the atmosphere. Now, because of a warmer atmosphere, it also has a higher water holding capacity. And also uh, the turnover of that moisture is also high. So overall, you're having a very accelerated hydrologic or water cycle compared to what it used to be before warming became much more intense. So that is why even with even if though there's been a decline in the Indian monsoon since the 1950s, more of that rain is now falling in shorter bursts. This is something that has been measured in various places. And you have seen some very extreme cases of that happening in the last uh, few decades. We, some years back, you, you we all, heard about what happened in Mumbai, where 950 millimeters of rainfall fell in a single day. Some years back in Chennai, we had 225 millimeters falling in a day and a half. Uh, just a, some weeks back, Hyderabad was battered by some very uh, intense showers. Uh, so it is even forests are being, uh, you know, the Shola forests and the Nilgiris have uh, not been able to cope with the some of the very intense rain, which has washed away. It actually washed away many of the instruments that is part of my site. Apart from that, it even uh, destroyed some uh, shola forests on the slopes. So even natural ecosystems uh, with the vegetation are now becoming vulnerable to these uh, uh, extreme rain events. So this is something that is a phenomena that has been measured, observed, and it's in keeping, um, it's, it's, in, it's consistent with some of the predictions made by scientists about the impacts of uh, global warming on the hydrologic cycle. Um, we have uh, Professor Rama from ICTS. She's going to ask a question now. Hi. Uh, yeah. So I wanted to ask you about this connection you made between flying rivers and these undisturbed continuous forest belts. So is it like a one-to-one, -one, like how strong is the correspondence between these? So, so, so basically, uh, earlier we didn't have the uh, tools and techniques to actually um, to measure these uh, what they what are they call as the uh, sky rivers, and uh, and in fact uh, the I mean everybody everybody knew even some decades back that the large amount of uh, evapotranspiration coming out of large patches of forest it must be getting recycled back as rainfall somewhere, maybe over the sea, maybe over somewhere else, or, you know, it's, but what has, uh, what we have been able to do, scientists have been able to do, is to actually track this using a variety of, of measurements, satellite, and, and many other uh, uh, meteorological measurements and uh, observatories. So now you're able to track these air parcels uh, as they move, uh, and you can even track uh, the moisture content in these uh, air parcels. So there are uh, satellites which are completely uh, devoted only to looking at, for example, the TRMM satellite, the GPM satellite. There are satellites which uh, what they do is they are able to detect the potential perceptible moisture in uh, the atmosphere or the rain clouds. Uh, and so they're able to track these parcels. So if you track a parcel of air that is passing over, let's say, 10 kilometers of forest, and then the same parcel of air then passes over another additional 50 kilometers of forest and so on, that is what has now been, uh, people have been able to do. And when they actually uh, looked at the data, they found that it was gaining in the moisture. And then it is able to deposit that moisture far away from the forest, which actually supplied that moisture to it. So that is something that's now uh, well uh, recognized. And, uh, and you know, there are some cities around the world also, some other studies have uh, shown that some cities water supply is actually being, uh, the, the, some of these sky rivers have been linked to the water supply of different cities around the world. And uh, so it's gone to that level. Um, and uh, I'm not the best judge of the quality and rigor of all the studies, but what I have been able to present to you is actually a very conservative approach. Some people have actually gone even further ahead and made even uh, bigger attributions of uh, the role of forest to rainfall. But uh, clearly the sky rivers that have been mentioned are, uh, are being supported by, uh, by a large uh, part, a community of uh, scientists. Thank you. Um, we have two more questions, Dr. Jagdish. One is by the Nandish who asks, 
to what extent habitat fragmentation in the western ghats is, uh, has impacted the southwest monsoons yeah so that would be part of my own curiosity for the future because we have seen that piece of work from iit bombay which says that um the western ghats forests are Uh, making a contribution to some of the rainfall that falls in and the water deficient parts of tamil nadu so that's okay let's assume that that is given now we also know that in the western ghats uh, you may have had deforestation no doubt about it but you also have replaced some of that uh, forest with other types of agro ecosystems you know whether it's areca or whether it's coffee plantations and many other so the vegetative cover in the western ghats which has replaced some of the lost forests is not necessarily uh, a low evapotranspiring uh, it may not be have been as good as the original rain forest or humid forest and so on but it's certainly not a uh, insignificant amount of uh, evapotranspiration so that is one thing to mention to mention that that uh, we know this is a very complex phenomena the effects of land cover change on a phenomena as complex as this uh, but in the western ghats Uh, the replacement of uh, natural forests with with the, again other types of uh, high uh, evapotranspiring or high transpiring types of uh, agro ecosystems makes this connection more complex um but we have we have definitely be very big gaps of forest in the forest you know uh, when you have uh, for example a large patch of forest gets converted into small patches of forest because of uh, roads and railways and and uh, you know other types of uh, human disturbance agriculture many other it's very likely that the uh, that the overall impact of this uh, this type of fragmentation on the, um, the surface energy balance on the evapotranspiration is going to be uh, very different from a intact piece of forest so as you saw that the strongest evidence for sky rivers has come from areas with very large tracts of connected forests so if at all any uh, lesson that we have to take from this is that whenever your forests are well connected keep it well connected uh so i think what i think this is going to be the last question um so this is by udaya shankar and he asks how does limiting carbon dioxide help in enhancing rains well uh, i don't know how we are going to limit carbon dioxide but uh, let us assume that uh, um, you know first of all the the, the connection is that uh, that you have uh, if you if it with respect to forests i'm talking about so uh, so we know that the carbon dioxide levels have been going up right and that's also you know that along with other greenhouse gases um, carbon dioxide has also been contributed to uh, warming so warming actually then what it does is it impacts the forest in various ways so this is not part of my talk today but some other day maybe i will share this is that the warming that we have seen is actually having a negative impact on many forests in india and elsewhere because uh, in the dry season um, they uh, there is a lot of stress on the forests and they are able they are uh, actually having um, um, not being able to cope with the temperature induced moisture stress this has happened in the western himalayas and it has been also been noted from other parts of uh, india as well so, and in other parts of the world as well so there is both greening and browning happening uh, in response to um, to uh, to the warming uh, effect of uh, global climate change so that's the negative effect that might happen on some forests so if you um, so and what i was mentioning about the co2 fertilization effect is that if you actually have higher levels of carbon dioxide then certain types of vegetation given everything else being the same the same amount of nutrients being available and so on because those are also limiting factors for vegetation and everything else being the same actually never actually happens in the real world but uh, let's just to take this argument forward let's say that everything else is not found limiting then higher levels of carbon dioxide in some types of vegetation may um, may result in lower levels of transpiration um so if you reduce the amount of carbon dioxide then you would actually have more transpiration if that is the prediction that you wanted to me to make i'm just saying from first principles that's what i would say so if you are able to actually reduce the concentration of carbon dioxide by some miracle based on uh, managing our human impacts on emissions and so on our lifestyles and everything else if we manage to do that yes uh, you will have an impact on the photosynthesis 
as well as the transpiration response of uh, forests. I think that's the last of all questions. Um, thank you, Dr. Jagdish, for being with us. It was a very interesting talk, very relevant to the present day. Thank you very much. Hope to have you soon. Um, thank you. I really appreciate the, um, the this opportunity to be with such a wonderful audience. And, um, and I'd like to thank the organizers for uh, giving me this uh, privilege. Yeah. So uh, before we end this session, I would like to announce that the next curios uh, Curiosity During Quarantine talk will be held on December 13th. It's a Sunday again and at 4 p.m. Um, so for this talk, we'll be having two speakers. One of them, Dr. Claudia Silva and Professor Oscar Garcia Prada from the Institute of Mathematical Sciences in Madrid. And they'll be talking about a column or the traditional Rangoli patterns we have and the math associated with it. So uh, more details about this program will be shared soon on our social media channels. Uh, hope, you to, hope you can join us for that talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I would like to thank everyone again, especially uh, the speaker for this wonderful talk and all the outreach team and the AV team for being there and uh, this wonderful uh, day today, evening today. Thank you very much. And uh, maybe we should end now. Thank you. Everybody be safe, be happy. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Take Bye. care.